Hallelujah. The goodness of God is just so overwhelming. You know, His love is... I do, there's no words to prescribe His words. In fact, last week, after Pastor Susan has uh, shared with us on the Word of God from Galatian about the promises of God, you know, I got so excited. You know, the moment he came down, I wanted to come up <laughs> and continue my, my sermon, which is supposed to be today, actually. <laughs> but when I read the, the book of Galatians, are we there? Where's the slides? You know, actually, the promises of God did not stop at where Pastor Susan has stopped. You know, it talks about the promises that God gave to Abraham. And when we look at all those promises, we realize that those are not simple promises. Those are not promises that are mediocre, but they are great promises. They are great promises. So before I go into that, this morning, actually, the Apostle Paul continues to tell us, to make us known that the promises of God does not stop at the fact that He has given it to Abraham. But in Christ today, we are given more, more than what God has even promised Abraham. If you think that the promises that God has given to Abraham is great, and to, to a certain extent, you know, we can be very contented and satisfied with it. I don't blame you. I, feel, I felt very contented last week when I came to know that how much God has blessed me, even made me a child of Abraham. But today, I want to share with you that as believers in Christ, according to the Holy Scriptures which Paul has delivered to us in Galatians, we are more, we are sons, we are heirs of the living God. Amen? And let us read Galatians chapter 3 from verses 26 to chapter 4, verse 7. This is the Passion Translation. From the Passion Translation, this is what is written for us. You have all become true children of God by the faith of Jesus, the Anointed One. It was faith, it was faith that immersed you into Jesus, the Anointed One. And now you are covered and clothed with His anointing. We are not any false children. The Bible tells us we are true children of God. How do we become the true children of God? It was by faith. By the faith of Jesus. If you read carefully, eh, it's not by our faith, you know. It's by the faith of Christ, the anointed one. Something to think about. We became the true children of God because Jesus believed in us. You know that? He gave himself on the cross. The Bible says that, but for the joy that was set before him, he was willing to suffer even unto death. When he saw us, he believed in us. And by that faith, we become the true children of God. It was faith that immersed us into Christ, the anointed one. And today, you and I are covered. We are clothed with His anointing. Wherever you go, you are covered and clothed. Yeah? This is amazing. And we no longer see each other in our former state. Jews or non-Jews, rich or poor, male or female, because we are all one through our union with Jesus Christ with no distinction between us. In other words, today, God sees us all regardless of whatever you may be, whoever you may be, from whatever background, race, culture, or creed, you are one in Christ. There's no difference. The only difference is either you are in Christ or you are not in Christ. To God, everybody who is in Christ has been united through Jesus. And since you have been united to Jesus the Messiah, you are now Abraham's child and inherit all the promises of the kingdom realm. Wow. Now, the Bible is very clear. It doesn't waste words. The Apostle Paul told, tells us that we are Abraham's child and we inherit all of God's promises. 
of the kingdom. How big is the kingdom of God? Now, now we begin to think about space, right? The physical part. But the kingdom of God is not determined by physicality. The kingdom of God is as big as this world? Yes and no. It goes beyond. It goes beyond the universe. It's as big as God. And we shall see that later. In a similar way, God has promised our ancestors something better. But as long as an heir is a minor, he's not really much different from a servant. Although he is a master over all of them, but for until the time appointed by the father, when he comes of age, the child is under the domestic supervision of the guardian of the estate. What Paul is referring to is the nation of Israel. When the new nation of Israel uh, was before Jesus, they were considered as the child that is underage. Even though they have that inheritance, but yet they cannot really enjoy the inheritance because they are a child. And the child is under the domestic supervision of the guardian of the estate. And what is that? All right? The Apostle Paul goes on to tell us, so it is with us when we were juvenile, we were enslaved under the hostile spirit of the world. He is talking about who we were before Jesus. Who we were. We were slaves. We were enslaved. But, when the Bible mentioned the word but, uh, you better take note. There's something special that's coming. But, okay, but, well, what happened, okay? But when the era came to an end and the time of fulfillment has come, God sent His Son. So, but, something happened. God sent His Son. He was born of a woman, born under the written law. Yet, all of this happened was so that He would redeem and free all those held hostage to that written law. So that He would redeem and He would free all those who are held hostage under that written law. And what is that written law? Today, we all know that is the law that was given to Moses. There are 600 over of them. Yeah, they were held hostage under that law. But now, at the appointed time, God sent His Son. He sent Jesus. And Jesus came to redeem and to free every one of us from that written law. Aren't you glad? Amen? Aren't you glad that today, you are no longer a slave, but you are a free man. You are a son of the living God, the Bible says. Yeah? And so that we would so that we would receive our freedom and a full legal adoption as children. There's a purpose for freeing you and me. The Bible tells us that God, the Lord came to redeem us. That means to buy back. We were slave. We were sold to the ways of this world. We were sold to be enslaved. But the Lord came and He bought us back. He bought us back by what? By His finished work on the cross. By His blood, He bought us back. And He bought us back for one purpose, for the purpose of giving us freedom and to make us His children. How wonderful. He did not just set us free. He did not just redeem us or purchase us and then, okay, you can do whatever you like and then you can live as you like and, uh, you know, I don't care anymore. You know, you're off my, my responsibility. That was not the case. The truth is that the Lord, uh, God sent Jesus so that when He has set us free, we can be free to be His children. Hallelujah. Just take this in for a moment, this truth. We can now be free to be His children. And how free is that? Yeah? Next, and so that we would know for sure that we are His true children, God did something else. God sent the spirit of sonship into our heart. Just in case we do not realize that God has set us free to be His children, God sent His spirit into our heart so that today we can call God our Father. We can cry out loud, 
Abba, Father, my Father, you are our true Father. So when we can call God our Father, it is by the grace of God and the Spirit of God that God has imparted onto us. Hallelujah. God actually confirmed our sonship by giving His Spirit to live in us today. That is the confirmation. He set us free to be His children so that today we can call Him Abba, Father. Amen. We no longer just merely call Him God. You know, the children of Israel call God, God. And He has many names in the Old Testament as we know it. But when Jesus came, Jesus revealed to them that God is also your Father. And that is something that is so foreign to the Jews. They would have never in their wildest imagination thought that God can be so close, so much so that He can be their Father. You know, we often thought that God is very far away. But when Jesus came, Jesus set us all free so that today we can call God Father. What a wonderful blessing. So, from the promises of Abraham, even during the time of Abraham, Abraham would not have even recognized the fact that God can be his father. In fact, God just called him a friend. He is a friend of God. That's about it. As great as the promises that God has given to Abraham, he was just a friend, nothing more. And when the law came through Moses, it was worse. They were slaves. But when Jesus came, the revelation of the grace of God reveals to us that God has set us free, redeem us, and now we have the spirit of sonship. Hallelujah, we now have the spirit of sonship. And whenever you call God, Abba, Father, wow, that is an amazing truth that God has given to us in our life. Therefore now, we no longer live, we no longer live like slave under the law. We no longer live like slave under the law. That means to say we no longer are bound by the do and the don'ts. I don't know about you. We are all families and some of us are fathers. You know, as much as you like to put rules to our children, which are good at times, that we do want the freedom to be given to them to be able to decide the best. Am I right or not? But besides, I mean, when they are young, we want to discipline them. We want to give them rules so that they learn. But as they grow up, as they grow up, like the age of my son now, 21, you know, it's very hard to give rules, right? So whatever we have taught them when they were young, now they can decide in freedom they can decide what is best and good. Amen? So during the time of the law, the Bible tells us they were juvenile. They were like young kids. But now, at the appointed time, God saw that it is the right time for the revelation of Jesus Christ. And now He considered us not children. He considered us an adult child. That He was so willing to give us the freedom so that we can decide. To follow him so we can enjoy being God's very own son and daughters we are no longer slave but we now what is the purpose of being a believer today we must enjoy being his children being his daughter and being his son and because we are his perhaps this is the best part huh? how to enjoy you say Vincent how am I supposed to enjoy God as a child you know the Bible tells us for her we can have access. We can access everything our Father has. How much God has, huh? Hey, a lot, man. <laughs> huh? Everything. Everything. If you can look up to the sky, wow, that's what my, my Father's own. And you know what? The Bible says you can have access to that. Whoa. Wow. It blows my mind. No wonder my Bible keeps telling us that there is much more, much more and much more. Because there's no word to describe how much our Heavenly Father has and how much He wants us to enjoy 
had as his children. And that also because we are heirs of God through Jesus the Messiah. We are what? We are heirs of God. Come on, let's repeat this. We are heirs, heirs of God. Now, what is heir of God? It's not heirs of everything God has. It's heirs of God. In other words, God wants us to realize we have Him. Yeah? It's not just having what He has, but we have Him. And that is most important. Most of the time, we tend to look at the resources that we have. But God wants us to look at the source. Amen? God wants us to look at the source. And who is the source? God is the source. God is the source. Many a times we will go to our bank account, you know, our resources, we say, Ay, uh, how I wish I got one more zero there. Yeah? And we look at our health, we say, we are lack of health. You know, how I wish I can have better health care. Or I can, I can have this or have that. And we look at our surroundings, we look at whatever we have, we look at the people, the relationship. We look at all these things and we allow them to affect us. But God asks us to look further. Yes, you can have everything that God has because He's your Father, but more so because you are an heir of God. Amen? Because you are an heir of God. You inherit God Himself. Oh, that is the big truth. You inherit God Himself. God has sent His Spirit to live in you and me. So if this truth can be grasped deep into our spirit and our heart, I tell you, everything else does not matter. You know your father will take care of you. So as I've said earlier, you know, God's promises is great because we have a great God. Am I right? We have a great God. And God has promised Abraham to be a great nation. He will, be have, he will have a great name. He will have great blessings. Uh, he will have great reward and great fruitfulness. Every promises, if you read back, as Pastor Susan has shared last week, it was all great. Because God was great. But more than that, more than that, we are happy that God is great. Because if God is great, we know that His blessing will be great. Yeah, we will be very happy. But because of Jesus, because of Jesus, this great God is also our good Father. Amen? So today, we do not only have a great God, but we have a good Father. And in John 20, chapter uh, 20, verse 17, after Jesus has resurrected, he met Mary. And this was what he told Mary. You know, when someone about to die, whatever he says is important, right? We want to know, hey, probably he leaves something for me, right? But when someone came back alive, resurrected like the Lord Jesus, oh, I think you better hear what he has to say. The first word he told Mary was, you know, God is now not just my God or my Father, but He is also now your Father and your God. Amen? And He told Mary, Now go to my brothers and tell them what I have told you, that I'm ascending to my Father. Now He repeats it again. Eh? Your Father to my God and your God. This is how important it is. We must take note of this. The first thing that Jesus told Mary to tell his disciples was the truth that God is not just your God, but God is also your Father. So today, we are so blessed to come to know this truth. And this truth was given to us, even on the cross. When Christ died on the cross, when Christ died on the cross, He cried, He cried, My God, 
my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? If you read the gospel, you realize that God, I mean rather, Jesus always addressed God as his father. The only time he did not call God his father was on the cross. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that today, you can say, my father, my father, why have you been so good to me? Amen? So that today, we can call God Father. He took what was ours and gave to us what was His. He took what was ours and gave what was His. So that today, we can go, call God our Father. And this relationship cannot be broken. It cannot be broken. Why do I say that? And it's an everlasting relationship. You know, by analogy, as human, we have relationships. In a marriage, there's a covenant that we sort of enter into with our spouse. As much as we would not want to break that covenant, of course, being human, there are times that we find that that covenant is broken. And people are no longer husband and wife, right? But when it comes to the children, you know, when I also attend to some of these matrimonial cases, yeah, my advice to couples who at the end of the day find no other ways but need to be divorced, my advice always to them is your children remain to be your children. You can never break that relationship. Whatever happens to both of you, they are still your children. Just like when Jesus on the cross cried out, my God, so that we can now cry out, my Father. That relationship that Christ has bought for us on the cross can never be broken. It can never be broken. It's an everlasting relationship. It is a blood-bought or bonded relationship. Jesus shed his blood so that we can call God our Father. Yeah? In the story of Abraham, we know that there were sacrifices made. And the sacrifices of no animal only brought about a friendship between Abraham and God. God say, you are my friend. But the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, with his blood shed, brought about an everlasting relationship with God as our Father. Wow. That's how much the sacrifice of Christ on the cross has done for us. And it is an intimate relationship. God wants an intimate relationship from from us now. If you read the Old Testament, we realize that it was, has, has been and always been the desire of God to dwell with, with His people. Am I right? You saw that when they left Egypt, when they went into the desert, God gave them instruction to build a tabernacle. We call that the tabernacle of Moses so that God can be with His people. But He remains in the tabernacle. So in whatever condition his people is, at the time they live in tents. God live in tents. Many years after that, they managed to conquer the promised land. They went to the promised land and God gave the promised land to them. And from that time onwards, they live in houses of bricks. Houses not even built by them, the Bible says. They enjoy. They enjoy what God has given them. And at the time, God also gave instruction later, many years later, for Solomon to build a temple of bricks. And God dealt with his people. But after Jesus resurrected, after Jesus' resurrection, what did God do? God came and lived in you and in me. The Bible says he tabernacled 
in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So today, God no longer lives in tents, nor even houses made of bricks, but today He lives in you, in you and in me. And that causes us to really think seriously about our relationship with God. God desires intimacy. And that's why He was willing to call us His children. And we can call Him our Father. Amen? Our good Father has made us heirs. And in lieu, what heirs of our heirs of His kingdom with all His promises. I don't know, I, I try to think about this, you know. All His promises, how many promises are there? Well, definitely more than the commandments and the laws. We know the commandments of, and the laws, they are 600 over, so we can count them. Can you count the promises of God? God asked Abraham to look up to the skies. He was like, wow. You know, then he told him to look at the sand. He was, wow, how am I supposed to count that? You know? So just imagine, God's kingdom and his promises is limitless. It's limitless. It is as eternal as God himself. Because the Bible tells us that we are heirs of God himself. If we are heirs of God himself, Wow, as limitless as God, as eternal as God is, that's how much we inherit. Amen? Luke chapter 12, verse 29, verses, verse 29 to 32, the Lord Jesus reminds us of how much, how important, how valuable we are. He said, I repeat it, he said again, huh? he said, don't let worry enter your life. Well, I like this paraphrase. You know, I've, I've read this. I'm sure all of us have read this in many other versions. But now I'm putting up the passion translation for us to look at. Huh? Don't let worry enter your life. Live above the anxious cares about your personal needs. People everywhere seem to worry about making a living. <laughs> Cantonese, huh? or Tim Yong Wan Sik. It's so true, right? You go into the world, in the working world, everybody is thinking how to make a living. Yeah? I think including us. But Jesus wants us to know one thing. He said, do not let worry enter into your heart. He didn't say do not worry. You know? He said, do not let worry enter your life. So in other words, worry can be outside. Everything that we see can worry us. Do not let it enter you. Why? Because he said, your father knows your needs. And we what? He will take care of you. He will take care of you. Each and every day, each and every day, not every week, not every month, but each and every day, he will supply your needs as you seek his kingdom passionately above all else. Amen? And we know today that His kingdom means God Himself. Uh, it's not a place. It's not a physical place. It's not even something that God can give you, but God Himself. Because we are heirs of God. So as you seek God, you will realize that God can supply all your needs and He can take care of you. So don't ever be afraid. I hope that today you hear this loudly. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. You may be facing challenges or struggles this morning. I do not know them. You know. God's words to you this morning and to me, myself as well, is that let us not be afraid. Because God has promised that He will supply us all our needs and He will take care of you. Why? Because you are His children. Because you are his children. Jesus said, if you who are evil knows how to take care of your children, how much more your heavenly father. Amen? How much more your heavenly father? We try our best as earthly fathers. There are times we lack. There are times we fail. But God never fails. God never lacks. And he has promised to supply all our needs. 
and take care of us because your father joylessly give you his kingdom realm with all his promises god is glad to even share and give you whatever he has amen secondly we are heirs of all his treasures all that christ is and has is yours where is god's treasure god's treasure is found in jesus when you see jesus you see god when you see jesus you see the father when you have all his treasures you have christ and when you have christ you have all his treasures romans chapter 8 verse 17 tells us and since we are his true children we qualified to share all his treasures for indeed we are heirs of god himself here we go again we are heirs of god himself we are not just talking about things that god can give you god wants us to know something deeper something higher something greater that you own god if i have to put it that way and you inherit him he is yours wow i don't know about you this is too much to swallow <laughs> i'll be glad you have, have things that god gave to me but the scripture tells us that today we have god himself and since we are joined to christ we also inherit all that he is and all that he has we will experience being co-glorified with him provided that we accept his suffering as our own amen we have all he is and all he has that is a lot i don't think in this lifetime we can fully enjoy them all so much so that god says okay i will bring you to heaven so that you can continue to enjoy them because in this lifetime if you want to enjoy as children all that god is and all that god has it's not enough it's not enough time god say come join me in heaven you continue to enjoy as my children amen our good father has promised us his children that he had covered and clothed us with christ's anointing we read that earlier he will take care of us this is just to summarize huh? he will supply all our needs he will give us all the promises of the kingdom of god he will give us the inheritance of christ all he is and all he has in john john 4 17 we read as christ is so are we in this world as christ is so are we in where heaven no here in this world so never ever look at ourselves in a way that we are nothing before god we are valuable before god god has promised that he will do all this for you and me it is him who will do it it's not you you and i are not capable we fail but god never fails there are times we are weak even like the apostle paul he said to god you know he cried out that his, the thorns that was tormenting him be taken away but the answer from the lord was my grace is sufficient for you my grace is sufficient for you in other words the lord is telling him i will do it for you i will help you in your weaknesses not you my grace and when the apostle paul come to realize about this truth wow it sets him free he sets him free to celebrate he sets him free to cry out that in my weaknesses all the more i boast of my weaknesses so that the strength the grace of god will rest in me hallelujah so today let me encourage you if you encounter weaknesses in your life challenges failures mistakes we are not perfect those are the moments that god will cease and he will show us that he can do way above anything that we can ever imagine or thought of because god is just not great not just great but he is our good father amen he's not just great but he is good you can be great but not good yeah king can be great but they may not be good 
but God is both great and good. Amen? So, hallelujah. We have all His kingdom, His promises, and His treasures because we have Jesus. Now, after delivering all this truth to us this morning, what do we do with them? Yeah, we have got all this, oh yes, God will take care of them. I mean, take care of me. God will supply all my needs. So how, how are we supposed to respond to this? How are we supposed to inherit all this? How are we supposed to receive all this? How do I experience God in my life? How do I know that I am the heir of God? How? Uh, that is very important, right? The Bible continues to tell us what is our response. Look unto the Father's love. 1 John 3, 1 John 3 tells us to look with wonder at the depths of God, the Father's marvelous love that He has lavished on us. He has called us and made us His very own children. The Bible encourages us to regularly look with wonder. You may be asking me, Vincent, what do you mean? Is God's love tangible? That I can look? How to look at God's love? Right? Maybe you say, I feel God's love, I can understand. Or experience God's love, I can understand. But look at God's love? How? Thank God the Bible revealed to us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrated His love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So where do we look? Where? We look at the cross. Amen? We look at the cross. Look at God's marvelous love for you and me in that we are now called and made His children. So whenever we are faced with challenges, trials and testing, we look back at the cross. At the cross, God demonstrated His love. He demonstrated His love towards us in that while we were still in our sin, while we were still weak, while we still fail, while we were nothing, it's not that when we were good or we did manage to obey God, it was not in those situations when God demonstrated His love. God demonstrated His love and His grace towards us in that while we were nothing, we were actually His enemies. And He demonstrated His love towards us. And the Bible encourages us to look at that love at all times. So our response to knowing that you and I are God's children is to constantly look at God's love. And that is the cross. Amen? That is the cross. God being a good father, He doesn't just tell you that He loves you. He shows you. If you are a good father, you will do likewise, right? You do not just tell your children, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, but you did nothing. A good father will not just tell the children that he loved them, but he will show them his love. In fact, God did more. God showed us his love while we did not deserve it. He did more. Most of the time, we only show love to our children because they are obedient, you know, when they deserve it. But God did more. God did more because He showed us His love when we did not deserve it. That is the extent of God's love, which is even more than ours. God's love will always be imprinted in the heart of a son. The love of a father will always be imprinted in the heart of a son. That's why we always encourage fathers to love their children and show them the love because as they grow up, that love remains. So today, you and I, as children of God, must also look onto that cross and let that cross, uh, look onto the love of Christ on the cross and allow that love to be imprinted onto our heart. Let the love of God to be imprinted onto our heart. Amen? Know how much God loves you. That's why I love that song. We will sing of the goodness of God. The goodness of God is the love of God. Amen? It's the love of God. 
our second response is that we must be now very bold to ask our Father. Bold. God wants us to be bold. If you are scared of asking your Father something wrong, something is very wrong between you and your Father's relationship. Amen? <laughs> Am I right? If you're always afraid of your Father, your Father come home from one side, you run to the other side. When he's here, you are there. When you're there, he's here. Something is very wrong. I hope we are not like this as far as God is concerned. God has already shown us how much he loves us and he wants us to call him Father. And he wants us to realize that we can ask of him of anything. This truth was given by Jesus himself. He said, here is the eternal truth. Wow, this truth is everlasting. From everlasting to everlasting. When that time comes, you will not need to ask me for anything. You, you don't need to ask Jesus. Jesus himself said, the time you come, you and I, will not, you will not need to ask me for anything. That time is already here. Huh? The time is now. He said, but instead, you will go directly to the Father and ask him for anything, anything you desire, and he will give it to you. Amen? What is anything that you desire? But of course, I hope you desire good things, right? We all desire good things. Amen? Huh? And He will give it to you because of your relationship with me. In other words, because we are in Christ and Christ in us. Until now, we have not been bold enough to ask the Father for a single thing in my name. But now, you can ask. Now, you can ask. As it doesn't stop there. And keep on asking Him. So I hope that if you have stopped asking God, because you felt that He's not answering your prayer, Jesus said to, told us today, encourage us to keep on asking. Amen? God wants us to keep asking Him. And you can be sure that you receive what you ask for and your joy will have no limits. Amen? Your joy will have no limits. So our response is to look onto Jesus, uh, look onto God's love rather, and the cross, and to be bold to us. Because God is good. Amen? God is good. Last, I want to leave you with a poem, a poem written by someone by the name of Marlene. This is what she has written. A king realizing his incompetence can either delegate or abdicate his duties. That happened to our Agong. <laughs> okay? He can have a decision not to be the king. But a father can do neither. If only sons could see the paradox, they would understand the dilemma. What do you understand from this? In other words, even a great king, he can step down from his throne. He has a decision. He can make a decision. He has the freedom to decide not to be the king. But the father does not have that. Liberty. He does not have the freedom to make a decision not to be a father. If you can only see as sons this dilemma, this paradox, when God calls us his children and we call him father, in other words, God is now so much obligated to supply all your needs, to take care of you, to, to free you, and to free me, to enjoy Him. Amen? I just want you to just, just take your stand right now. Hallelujah. Just rise. Hallelujah. I hope you have received this word not just into your mind, not even into your heart, but this morning, let the truth of the Word of God, the scriptures that, have, that I've read, go into your spirit, man. To go into your spirit, man. Let's absorb them into your spirit, man. God never lie. He cannot lie, the Bible says. So this morning, I just want us to spend some time thinking about the goodness of God. We talk about the greatness of God, but today, this morning, we want to ponder upon the goodness of God. Why is, so, why is God so good to me? It's always the question, why? Because God today is our Father. Oh, beloved, 
But what Lord wants you to realize, He will take care of you. He will supply all your needs according to His riches in glory. Amen. He has given you everything, His kingdom, His promises, His treasures. There's no need to worry. Let not worry enter your life. Live above anxiousness and realize that God will take care of everything. Our Father will take care of everything. Amen. Let's spend some time to release all our cares to Him, even right now. Release them to God. Oh, cast your cares onto Him, Jesus said. The Bible says, cast your cares onto Him, for He cares for you. If you have cares in your heart right now, cares for your health, cares for your finances, cares for relationship, this is the time this morning God is saying, cast your cares to me, for I care for you. Amen. Cast your cares onto me, for I know them all. I know all your needs. I know all your needs, my children. I've given you my best. I've given you my son. You have seen my love for you on the cross. And that's how much I love you. While you were, y'all, you did not deserve it. I gave you my son. And if I give you my son and did not spare him, I will give you everything that your hearts desire. I will take care of your needs. I will supply to you. I am the supplier. I am the source. Do not look at your resources. They may be lacking. They may not be enough. But look at me. I'm your source. Put that into your heart and your spirit this morning. Oh, beloved sons and daughters of the Most High God, you are heirs of God. You are heirs of the living God. You are heirs of Christ. You are co-heirs with Him. Whatever you have comes from Him. Whatever He has belongs to you as well. If you have seen the riches of Christ while He was on earth, he has never gone into a situation where he need anything. Every time there was a need, he even supplied them. He supplied the needs of the 5,000 with only two loaves of bread and five fishes. He can, fed, he can feed them all. Oh Lord, you can feed us all this morning. We pray Lord that this morning we will receive what our hearts desire from you. We know Lord this morning your word has come forth. Your word is truth and your word will not go back to you void or empty. Your word will take effect. Your word this morning will accomplish what it has sent out to be done. Father, we want to praise you. We want to thank you. We want to acknowledge your goodness. We want to declare that you are our Father and there's no other. Hallelujah. You are not just great, but you are a good Father. We want to praise you at this very moment, Lord, whatever that's disturbing us in our heart, whatever that is interfering us in our life, we cast them away, we cast them into your hands, knowing that, Lord, you care for us. You have promised us that you will care for us. And we believe you, Lord. We believe you. We want to take that into our heart. Lord, we know that there may be lack in this hall. There may be people who are crying out. But we know, Lord, you are the one who will attend to their needs. Oh, Lord, you say that you are the father to the fatherless. Hallelujah. You are the husband to the widow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are the one, Lord. We praise you.